So this next session is going to be looking at how geospatial capabilities can support the alignment of finance and sustainability. We've got a great panel and so really I think focusing on some of the, the practitioner perspective, um, some of the examples of what is possible now, or maybe what um, some of the panelists might like to be possible, some of the gaps that they see and how they think that geospatial information might be helping them to um, close those gaps. I'm going to um, introduce each person um, very briefly now and then um, hand over to the first speaker just to give some introductory remarks. And we will leave time for any questions um, from the floor. So do, as we go along, um, note down anything you'd like to ask the panel. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Ben Yeo, um, Senior Portfolio Manager, Global Equities at RBC Global Asset Management. Um, and we have John Gascoigne, Director of Risk Analytics at Willis Towers Watson. Rebecca Self, who is the CFO, Sustainable Finance at HSBC. And Carol Cronenberg, who is the lead MRV at the EBRD. Um, so Ben, maybe if I can start with you from, from a, um, the RBC perspective and really giving that practitioner view. Sure. Uh, I noticed maybe about a quarter of the audience have gone, hopefully just to get some water. We will be just as interesting as everyone else, so <laughs> do, come back, uh, do come back in there. So I think there's a realization today within a lot within the investment chain that financial capital is not the only form of capital. So we've used this word of capital in terms of that, but there, there are other forms of uh, capital which are really important. And sometimes it comes under this rubric of intangibles, sometimes it comes under the rubric of ESG, pre-financials, extra financials, non-financials. We still do have a terminology issue here, but uh, we you know started to name them. Uh, human capital, social capital, intellectual capital, manufacturing capital, that type of relationship, capital, and of course, environmental capital. And I think a couple of the realizations are, uh, one, that the value in companies today, and in fact, in society overall, the majority of the value is in these other capitals, not necessarily the financial capitals, but that they power long-term wealth and financial capitals over the long term. Another couple of observations is that a lot of these capitals are intersectional, as we would, uh, as we would imagine. They power each other. You have uh, spillovers and things like that, particularly within, uh, within intangibles. And then with this concept of capitals, you can nurture them or destroy them as your value as your, as your companies. And so when specifically when you're thinking about uh, the environmental capitals, then it's very easy to see that you can destroy them and you will destroy long-term value, or you could nurture them and look after them and actually create long-term uh, value from that. The other interesting aspect about a lot of these intangible capitals is that they are uh, not very well measured or and accounted for, so we did that. Although you'd be surprised also on the financial capital front, if you meet many accountants around there, they still argue about what is cash or non-cash on the balance sheet. So there is you know, a lot of argument on that. You know, you go to another order of magnitude to saying, well, what are these other capitals, environmental, human, intellectual, how do we, how do we manage and measure those? And I guess there's two parts to this. One is said, if you, if you don't try and measure and manage it, or what you do measure tends to get looked after. But then there is another part, which is actually not everything that you can count really counts, or, you know, the opposing one in that sort of aphorism. So there's a lot of things that we might not be able to count very well, but we know it's really important, or we might be able to get orders of magnitude or the bucket without something to five decimal places, or in fact, if you are already going to even one decimal place, you've kind of missed the point. So all of these kind of extra financial intangible capitals uh, coming through uh, really important. But then within spatial finance and things like that, generally transparency has always helped, so that the better that you get an idea of what what these capitals might mean, how they've meant over the long term, means that you can, you can nudge the system along, either from company specifics uh, to the country or systems level. And I think one of the other things I'm quite interested or excited by is that you can start to see that it is intersectional across all companies and sectors 
and geographies because I guess within this space there's been a lot of focus on certain sectors and companies as you kind of see as the kind of obvious first order effects and impacts. But actually every single company or country is going to be impacted by climate change, environmental capital, all of one of these other capitals. And you, you can start to nudge to how to see that it might not just be the focus ones that you need to look at, but across the value chain, as it is across the investment chain of companies, and having the data and having the conversation to bring that conversation forward is really important and quite exciting. And I think it will be then how people use it, how think about it. You'll find a lot of these other second order effects, which actually might prove to be more valuable uh, in, terms of untudging, in terms of nudging that system along. So realization, intangible value, probably the majority of our value today. Uh, better measurement and things of those type of in, intangible values and their synergies and intersections will just drive forward, I think, that kind of understanding and realization. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, Rebecca, I'm actually going to come to you next um, and maybe just going into a little bit more detail then from an HSBC perspective, I know you've been leading a lot of the work around things like TCFD and the challenges of getting the kind of information that you need in those sorts of areas. So maybe you could say a little bit more about that and how you think geospatial might help. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm one of those chartered accountants yeah. you mentioned. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's a few different ways that I think about this. Um, firstly, I'm a chartered accountant by training, had a whole slew of different finance jobs, um, and started looking at ESG about five or six years ago. And at that point, data and disclosure immediately sort of struck me as a big gap. And it still is, frankly, and I think this is part of it. Um, and the next disclosure I've started looking at over the past two, three years, although most of the work is internal rather than external, is TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And that includes a few different elements for HSBC. What I look at covers the group. Um, I can think of the linkages here. So firstly, from a risk point of view, we'll be looking at the physical risk of our loan portfolio. And that could be wholesale loans. It could be where those loans are, where the assets are based. Are they in flood areas? What sort of other physical risks or Oh, I can't talk. Um, I'll, I'll Catastrophes. <laughs> yeah. Um, could they be exposed to? Um, we'll also look at resilience of our own operations in that context too. So, for example, our data centers, where are they based? And we've had situations where we've moved them based on some of these physical risks. So that's one example. And there are other types of risks that we look at too. The piece I'll also mention is opportunities. And there, um, we have been approached, and we have looked at some companies where they'll look at different types of data to analyze uh, perhaps where solar panels should be placed. Um, what's the sunlight in those areas? What's the slope and gradient of the roofs? And that can also be helpful to identify where there could be loans, where there could be opportunities. And um, so I think there's lots and lots of different types of data. Um, I think this is certainly a part of it. Um, and it's going to continue to evolve and expand over time. And the other piece is this isn't happening in isolation. Um, at the same time as this type of data and MI and machine learning, the banking industry is also going through quite an innovation itself too um, in terms of systems, processes, accounting. Um, so I think integrating and joining those two together has a lot of power. Great. Thank you very much. Um, John, maybe coming to you next, clearly, um, particularly around the physical risk, this is an area where you've been doing work for, for many, many years. So, yeah, sure. if you could share some insights. Yes, and building on some of Rowan's introductory comments, mm. the insurance industry, uh, spatial finance is a great phrase, and it speaks directly to the fundamentals of insurance and diversification of risk, both geographically and by line of business, for example. And a lot of the geolocation and the uh, tremendous earth observation uh, examples that we've seen today have been incorporated into the industry, particularly with respect to assessing and quantifying the risk to natural hazards, which leads inevitably on to the non-stationary world we find ourselves in with, chat with dealing with climate risk on top of those hydrometeorological risks, windstorms, floods, for example, that the industry has been studying 
for over 30 years now. And there are two main components. There's understanding the hazard. So, for example, uh, we saw the dam example. Uh, how can we best get a, a very high resolution digital elevation model, as they're called, of the landscape, so we can model river flows, water flows, for example. Um, so that's a fundamental part of uh, capturing the hazard. It also plays, the remote sensing work plays a fundamental part in the input data for the modeling for corporates and our clients, for example. Where is their value at risk? Where are their assets? And the insurance industry has spent, has invested considerably over that time in a wide range of geolocation technologies. Um, we have a global requirement as well, of course, and there's obviously a great, great variety of data quality and data availability globally, and we have to handle all of those uh, different permutations to come up with our risk measurements. And fundamentally, the industry sees the sustainability challenge through the risk lens and notions of both corporate and societal resilience. So ideally, this work can inform a very broad stakeholder range uh, for that work. So, for example, um, satellite imagery of where are urban areas and at what resolution can we get to? 20 years ago, when we were working at province or postcode level, we're very familiar now with handling portfolios of millions of risks at latitude, longitude level, as we've seen the broader revolution, technological revolution in geolocation technology. And, um, so, uh, and also land use, we've seen agriculture, for example, uh, and there are insurance products that are built on remote sensing technology. For example, uh, Africa Risk Capacity uses satellite information to look at drought and uh, forecast-based financing. To what extent can we use forecasting to give us uh, a few months lead time on where food scarcity issues might be so that we put at risk management uh, techniques and best employ emergency response. And we also saw a couple of uh, very remarkable examples of event response mapping, that near time uh, capability to be able to report. And this is where we're working with aid agencies, aid agencies, NGOs, UN, international organizations on how we can best coordinate all of this activity because this technology speaks and links up so many stakeholders across the space. Um, the fascinating thing over the last 12 months is that we're seeing the knowledge and experience that we've got on the liability side of the balance sheet through claims, for example, shifting over to the asset side of the balance sheet. To what extent does the knowledge we have, how can we incorporate and extend our analytics and tools and products to the needs of the much broader finance sector? And it was quite interesting that that notion of purpose that came up uh, in, in the previous session about how can we attract the brightest and the best into the finance sector with the climate risk challenge how do we affect societal uh, improvements and resilience at scale? The finance industry has a fundamental role to play in that. So we're seeing technology people again in, across NGOs, but also across much, much more broadly across finance. So there's a very good argument to attract that talent to the industry. And um, perhaps finally, well, this, uh, the Green Finance Initiative and the Spatial Finance Initiative, this is a great way to tackle some of these combined and mutual challenges. How do we co coordinate activities? Because there is a cost aspect to this. There's also how do we incorporate the, the leading edge science on climate risk, for example. We tend to deal on acute risks, so those extreme events, and how are those frequencies and, and severities going to change. We need to also tackle chronic risks of heat and water stress, and also systemic network risks of sort of supply chain implications. And Again, we have to be able to work at a variety of re resolutions. We can always aggregate up, but for corporates, again, ideally we need to work at that asset data level. And we're familiar with working at that level for uh, insurance clients, for example. We need, to, we need to build that and take that forward. Uh, a little plug about UK PLC. We are lucky to have such a tremendous experience in, in university and science of applying this work and developing products. We've also got a you know, global center of finance, so there's tremendous expertise in developing products because we've got to learn to speak the language of how to deliver risk indices, for example, and the needs will be slightly different for asset management, for example, in infrastructure investment. 
How can we get this analytics into the bloodstream of those activities? And we're also very lucky, you mentioned TCFD, for example, the work of the Bank of England and the PRA, which regulates insurance, for example, where some of these risk measures are, we have to report on those to demonstrate solvency against risk. Um, again, we're lucky to have that force pushing us along. So um, these are very exciting times. There are some considerable challenges, but there's a real new field opening up here, I think. Okay, Carol, coming to you um, last. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I want to bring in maybe some, some other aspects. Um, uh, I work for the European Bank for Reconstruction Development Bank. Uh, we are a multilateral development bank. Um, we mainly do direct finance. We mainly do project finance. So we really want to make, well, changes on the ground. The, our mandate is very much about transition of economies. Um, it's very much aligned with the development uh, goals. And we think this, this development on, uh, on geospatial science and uh, data that become available are extremely important. Um, not important from, I would say, a more defensive point of view of, of, of taking risk considerations into account, but very much also the commitment of the multilateral development world to, to align with the Paris Agreement and achieve the Paris objectives and the Paris goals is, is hugely important. And um, we're all aware of the I recent IPCC report. We have to make our changes in the coming five years. We have to bend the curve in the coming five years. And we think that data availability, artificial intelligence, but also geospatial information is crucial to make this bend. So Gordon was mentioning uh, the urgency of three to five years. Um, I, I totally agree, also from a point of view of, um, of, of climate change. If you look at uh, what, what could geospatial capabilities do for, for our day-to-day -day business, it is basically related to two, two elements. Uh, the first element is very much into product design, product selection, and using, I would say, Exanta data to, to select what are the projects that will have the biggest impact and will have the biggest transition impact. Uh, for instance, EBD does invest a lot also in refugee camps, so we saw already examples on how you can, uh, can measure that, how information can help. But for instance, we, um, we have also been investing uh, heavily in the, uh, in the hydropower sector in Tajikistan. Um, the investments were very much related also to the, I would say, climate change impacts of, of the uh, different hydrological circumstances in the country. It's very much dependent on, on glaciers. And the, de the, the investment decisions were very much informed by these, I would say, geospatial information to make a better design of the system, to make it more climate resilient, and also to target, uh, to target certain investments uh, into, into certain pieces of, uh, pieces of equipment. What I want to talk about more and what I want to stress today is the importance of uh, geospatial capabilities for ex post monitoring. Um, I was at the COP uh, uh, in... Um, in, in Poland, and we had a, a big discussion with the UNFCCC uh, around their biannual assessment. The biannual assessment basically shows hey, how much how much climate finance is getting into 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 developing uh, countries. Um, but it is all very much focused on finance, and 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 the, and, the, and the issue that is really missing is about what are the impacts? How can we measure the impacts? Um, and we get more and more of those type of questions that our shareholders, but also impact investors, but also uh, buyers of our green bonds, they really want to know what is happening when a project is being implemented and what are the, are the results and the impacts. And for this uh, purpose, um, we need to have much better systems and much better, I would say, uh, capabilities. Um, because this, inf this information is getting, is getting much more important than just counting the beans, just counting the financial flows. Uh, I can give you one example, um, which is maybe not geospatial uh, that much, but at the moment we are working on a, I would say, automated MRV system, uh, which basically means that we build in very small transponders in projects, for instance, in uh, uh, renewable energy projects. These data are being uh, uh, gathered together in, um, in, in central databases and being processed and gives us uh, quite a, I would say, online and direct information on how projects are being, are performing. The big advantage of that is that, uh, and instead of saying that it costs money, it is, it is really a cost saver because 
you really, yeah, these automated systems, these, I would say, global working systems, in the end are much cheaper than having to set up all types of uh, administrative systems, all types of verification systems, all these systems that we know from the, from the past when we're doing a lot of CDM projects. I mean, these monitoring costs were huge, and one of the reasons why we hardly have any CDM project in the transport sector is because we were not able to monitor it in a cheap way. Now we will get these, these capabilities, both on basically on the ground systems like, for instance, measuring the amount of people that are traveling in, in public transport by, by basically GSM signals. But on the other hand, also eh, having information coming from space, seeing how traffic flows are developing in time. I mean, these are, these are very powerful tools that, that we really need to develop better instruments to cope with the climate change challenge that we have in, uh, in, in, the, in the world at the moment. Great, thank you very much, Carl. Um, so I'm going to pick up on a, a couple of those themes and then um, come for questions. So maybe first one, um, one of the pieces of work we've been doing from an um, accounting for sustainability perspective is, is around the role of technology. You've seen te the interface between technology and finance really reshaping or starting to reshape that role um, and really be leveraged. You've seen a lot of discussion around the sustainability technology interface and how technology can maybe help both in terms of the, the information, the insight, but also some of the solutions that we need to find. Um, and I guess here what we're looking at and, and through our work, the intersection between those three. Um, I think you all touched on a few different examples, either of where the aspiration might be or some concrete examples of where that's starting to happen now. Um, maybe picking climate change first, um, but then broadening that out to some of the other risks or opportunities um, captured by the, the sustainable development goals and, and sustainability more broadly. Where would you see the current state of use? How far along that curve are we? Clearly, in terms of climate change, we have a very limited time to act. Um, so where is the current state and how could that be accelerated? How could the knowledge be transferred much more widely? Um, and then secondly, you know, what, what will really be the most effective ways of scaling up use? So I don't know who wants to um, come in first on that. Rebecca? Thank you. Um, so perhaps to talk a little on, on the systems and processes piece and how this combines, I think that integration point is really key. Um, so where are we today? Traditionally, with banks which have grown by acquisition, there's a whole patchwork of systems and infrastructure underneath. Uh, you have transactions, and if I take HSBC as an example, we, we have 38 million customers globally. We're in 66 countries. There are billions of transactions. Um, almost every day, probably almost every minute. And so aggregating all of those takes very, very long time um, for a whole slew of people within a finance department. And then to add on transition risk, where we're analyzing how our customers and ourselves will be exposed to climate change. Um, for example, looking at our supply chain of our customers, um, if they have um, certain parts, which could be for internal combustion engine cars, for example, um, which could be a high exposure, layering that on at the top is really challenging. And there are sort of really mundane things that you get into. For example, mapping. The customer name might be quite different from the data input compared to the traditional finance system. And suddenly you end up with this sort of horrible manual process. Um, so I think that connection, making um, everything sort of talk to one another, and the automation piece is really important. Right now, um, it takes quite a long time, but I see in the next three to five years with some of the finance processes, quite a radical change with AI, with machine learning. Um, I've even heard some talk about having real-time financial results, so you don't have a traditional month-end, year-end. You can sort of push a button two minutes and you get, get the entire results of the company. And then you can layer on this transition risk piece and do it much more quickly and effectively. And I think on the previous panel, we were talking about real-time data. I think that is so important. We don't have the time, um, as we mentioned. So being able to do that in a quick and efficient way um, would be really great. So hopefully, big change over the next coming years. John? Yep. Yes. Uh, what we've seen over 
over the experience of the insurance industry, you get sort of quantum steps of development. Um, you know, I suppose there was a time before Google Maps and Google Earth, and then it's there and ubiquitous. And we're really at a stage now where uh, we're at another, another one of those jumping off points. The question is, um, and it plays back to some of the points again on the previous panel about transparency, availability of data, robustness of data, um, and who's going to develop it, how available is it. So there will be intellectual property aspects around that as well. Um, there are real opportunities to develop data sets for the marketplace as a whole, and that allows a many eyes perspective of transparency and v validation of those products. And that might be some th from some sort of third party supplier, or also working as we do with sort of again universities and re uh, research institutions. And, and that also speaks to that question of who's, who's going to pay for those things. There will always be competitive advantage on top of that pre competitive space, if one wants to call it for, again, how you integrate it, how you apply it, because that is a tricky business and time-consuming. And the more resources you commit to that, the more effective and efficient you will be. So I think we have to learn lessons and not repeat the wheel in lots of different areas to be as efficient and effective as possible to get that speed of change that we need. So we need strong alignment and strong coordination. And just to understand how we go from need to demand and to make sure that the tools that, and products that we develop and deliver speak the language and can be absorbed quickly into the, into the bloodstream of differing finance applications. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Um, and the challenge goes, uh, I would say, beyond just uh, or adding a, a, another column in a spreadsheet with environmental data. It is. Um, uh, EBD works a lot with, I would say, also our clients, but it also counts for us, and that it, uh, that it basically you will need also organizational changes. Uh, traditionally, I would say the, the, the climate issues were being dealt by an environmental department. Very much, I would say, uh, risk management, very much compliance driven. And what you see nowadays is that suddenly our people from risk are saying, hey, this is an important topic. You see people in banking uh, that really grasp the opportunities and start to work on that. Um, uh, basically, you see all different, I would say, spots in an organization starting to use information, um, developing their own spreadsheet, developing their own data. Um, and it re there is really a need in the organization to, 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 uh, to, to, to centralize it and also to, to come up with, I would say, common practices and also uh, developing the metrics uh, and, the, uh, and the indicators that you are using throughout your organization. And that's, and that's quite a challenge. And that's what, well, we basically see as, as, as the biggest challenge. Um, it, it goes beyond organizations because if you look at the MDB community, yeah, we, we, we are harmonized uh, to a certain extent. We have, I would say, the same shareholders. They expect the same type of reports. And also on that level, you see that, that further harmonization I is, is important. Um, the EU is also recognizing this. So they have formed a uh, technical expert group uh, developing a taxonomy. But it needs to go a step further. It needs also to go, what are the metrics? How are we going to develop metrics? What are, how do we define CO2 reductions? Because uh, after Paris, that is not clear anymore. And I think the way uh, spatial information is being gathered and also being processed may give quite, quite a good direction because we're talking about global information. And I think there is a key role also for this initiative to play not only about um, well just giving data, but also about um, how to how to analyze data and how to use data for your I would say financial practices. Mm. And maybe just as a follow up question to that, one of the things that um, certainly looking at the taxonomy work mm -hmm. um, is of course the concern around you know can you really get to the point of measuring impact and being able to compare in a bit more of a like to like for like way the different kind of products that are starting to come on the market linked to social environmental um, opportunities or risks is this something and there was an example earlier from FTSE it's one of the questions of um, how this kind of data is starting to be used to maybe build into some of those indices I mean, do you see um, an opportunity to be really leapfrogging in terms of that measurement of the ultimate impact and the traceability of it? 
Yeah, there is a lot of discussion going on. Uh, for instance, for green bonds, uh, you see that um, green bond well, requirements or principles are going also into the direction that you are actually also going to show uh, what are my impacts of my green bond. So it's not only about labeling certain activities green, but also about what, what, is, what is actually being achieved, both in terms of, um, I would say, low carbon uh, development, but also in terms of, uh, of climate resilience. And, and climate resilience is, of course, very, I would say, context, location specific. And, and there you see, again, uh, the importance of the role of uh, having uh, information, location specific, uh, specific information. You also see that at an EU level, uh, they're working now on a, on a green bond standard. And also there, there will be quite, I would say, strong requirements to, to, report, to report on impacts. Um, so that's, uh, that's indeed an important, uh, important topic. Uh, ben, coming to you, whether, whether you want to comment on that discussion, but also um, you touched not just on the natural capital, environmental capital area, but also things like social capital and relationship. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how you either already are or how you see the potential to be expanding the kind of information you might have to, to understand some of those capitals and the interconnection between them. Sure. So technology with climate change and social capital and items like that. So it's a huge lever on the opportunity side as well as looking at the risk side. And I think what it's starting to do is just spread across from the obvious areas to across the whole chain where we see that it's affecting all industries uh, and all companies. And then from an investor point of view, also across the investment chain, you know, initially a lot of focus on equities, but we always had a chat on infrastructure, there's bonds, there's alternatives. So it's across the investment chain and across all of the companies, not just the ones which might have a very intense carbon scope one or two kind of impact to think of, and to think about that. And then I think the nature of technology is it works best where it intersects with other technologies. It's always synergistic. We've already talked about it. The data in isolation doesn't tell you anything. It needs the person, it needs the computers, it needs the AI, it needs other technologies, it needs collab collaborators, it will need other companies. And then this is where you see the intersection across the other capitals, although we name them. But things like human migration and the movement might, might start from a direct physical risk or something happening there, but part of what we're seeing in terms of the uh, migration, either forced economic or not, is a lot of stemming from uh, changes due to climate. And so we realize that that's being very interconnected and technology is kind of revealing um, a lever for that. But then in terms of solutions and opportunities, I think we're having to also see that it is across things, it's complex and it's gonna need um, technology and all of these other parts working together to elucidate both sort of the challenges, which are, some of them are not well understood, um, as well as the solutions and opportunities on that side. And just picking up in a little bit more detail in terms of some of the, um, one, one of the areas that I think is quite interesting in the, the social space is also then things like labor rights or human, um, some of the, the, the human rights issues and a discussion on how um, geospatial information might be used in some of those areas where you can really get down to you know, individual factories and conditions and, as you say, movement of people. But then, of course, one of the, the themes that does come up is, is of course, um, some of the risks associated with access to the, this information. And um, I'd be interested in, in everyone's views on, on actually we have, we've touched on the opportunity side, but actually some of the protections that might be needed or where you would see that whole discussion in terms of um, particularly where it comes to the people side of the equation rather than the, the physical side. Well, harking back to uh, Will's point from the CFA, there, I think there does need to be an evolving conversation around the responsibilities of various organizations, institutions, and, and stakeholders. You know, what is the responsibility of business, governments, and things like that with an evolving ethics where I think it's, it's very obvious that, you know, as the general population or even people in, you know, in this room, you know, the ethics of some of this information, bioethics, I do a lot within the biotechnology world, we're just not where we are in terms of what we can do in gene splicing from actually plants all the way into animals. Uh, let alone where the, there is. And there will come the time where we have to think about, well, 
what is the responsibility when we have this information? Does it fall on business? Does it fall on governments? Does it fall on NGOs? Or most likely, in my view, that there'll have to be some collaboration uh, amongst these, because these are actually complex problems which don't have simple solutions. This idea that there's kind of going to be one magic bullet or one thing to solve these things, if it was probably that obvious, we're not so stupid that we wouldn't have done it already. So uh, there's going to be these kind of the, these kind of complications, and it intersects with the other um, social political things that we can see at the moment, such as uh, inequality. Out of the seven billion people today, you know, maybe about one billion don't have access to the internet or things like that. So you you're getting technology itself is actually uh, it looks like it's probably embedding some of the inequalities that we see particularly at least in terms of deep poverty and, and, and things like that. So there has got to be an evolution of saying, okay, actually the technology and data is now here. Where is the conversation about how we're going to use that? How are the various actors are going to do that? And there probably has to be more collaboration than, than we're currently seeing if it is, it is these complex problems that we want to solve. Great. Okay, so any questions from the audience? Um, I'm going to take a few at the same time. So there's one up there, and then the second one just up there. And then the, the second one is just here. Right, if you could ask your question. Oh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. So I'm Ricky Nathvani. I'm an incoming machine learning researcher at Imperial College London. Um, and uh, I want to thank the panel for the discussion. I think there were some really interesting ideas coming around from this idea of collecting data in a uh, global manner to inform finance and also talking about being able to react to that data um, quicker than has ever been possible. I guess what concerns me is that it sounds like there's the potential for a perfect storm of destructive feedback loops um, from this idea. So we've talked very about, um, a lot about data as this kind of objective entity that's collected from the ground up to inform high-level strategic decisions. And I think the other way around hasn't really been covered so much. Um, the reason this concerns me is because we've seen how uh, the use of strategic decisions to um, collect data in the first place can have a massive impact. So in the field of predictive policing and risk analytics, going into vulnerable neighborhoods where you aim to collect data in an objective manner can then inform how you police those neighborhoods. And what happens is you end up in a feedback loop where the actual need to collect data uh, changes the nature of that data itself. It closes off windows and this goes back to what Will mentioned in his talk, you can't fix a problem you can't see. And so where the focus of data collection is applied has a massive impact not only on the outcome of uh, the decision making you make, but also how the nature of that data is going to change itself. And I guess in the field of finance, we've seen similar thinking happening for years. VC companies have invested in a particular kind of company because they've seen early success from a handful of groups, and that has gone on to inform the heuristics they make for then investing in similar companies, companies down the line. So I guess my question is, it's all very well and good to have a apolitical uh, conception of data, as informing objective decisions, but what needs to happen on the higher levels and strategic um, fields to then inform how that data is collected and analyzed? Because I know as a researcher, what I choose to look at and the data I choose to collect is going to be driven by what I perceive to be high impact. And that is informed, in fact, from a not very objective place at all. It's informed by stakeholders, motivations, and so on. And I guess I interested to see uh, what's being done in that space. Great. Um, and then the question yeah, sure. in the middle up here. Um, it's Beth Burks from S&P Global Ratings. So my question is really, um, how do we get the accountants on side? So if we looked at the spatial resolution of Planet that they were presenting, they've got three meters by three meters recording on a daily basis. Financial reporting, maybe quarterly, maybe continent level, usually global at the issuer level. Sometimes you get country level information, it's not fully um, disaggregated, uh, not all financial metrics are reported at that level. So how do we square the differences in spatial resolution and, and what's being done in the accounting space around that? Okay, great, and then I'm going to take a third um, question and then come to the panel for responses. Yep. Hi, Peter Cripps from Environmental Finance Magazine. Does the panel feel that the growing availability of this data will 
actually just by being there improve company disclosure itself. Some of the data may be stuff that companies don't know, but some of it may be just stuff that companies already do know and they're not really sharing it with investors. So is there any evidence that having this will, date investors effectively off, uh, threatening to disintermediate investors from the uh, reporting chain. If you don't give us this, we'll go and find it out ourselves. So investors start being more responsive as a result. Sorry, companies start being more responsive to investors, sorry. So let me just um, clarify. So you're saying that if um, if investors can get it anyway, then companies will be more responsive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any evidence that they'll start to disclose more? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so who wants to go for the first one? John, maybe I'll yeah. pick on you yeah, to... Can, um, comments on the first yeah. one? Because it's a crucial point. Yeah. There's a cost associated to data collection, and very often it's the industrialised world where we have the most data availability. And uh, for climate risk, for example... We are familiar that the most vulnerable economies globally are the ones that are likely to be impacted the most, and yet it's where we've got data scarcity. So at one level, there's the opportunity for remote sensing, for example, to allow a form of leapfrogging technology like mobile telephony, for example, in providing data sets for very vulnerable communities. Um, another aspect is... Um, Citizen science and uh, crowdsourcing, for example, so bottom-up data collection. As the costs of a lot of uh, the technologies are reduced relatively, we're seeing OpenStreetMap, for example, or Hot OSM, where uh, post-response people are going around taking photographs of impacted areas to help emergency uh, 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 agencies deal with those situations as quickly as possible, and the rapidity of the response can massively reduce the knock-on consequences of malnutrition, for example, or, or, or shelter problems, or even civil unrest. Um, so there are some quite interesting examples. And, and it's that aspect that the data can serve many, many stakeholders. So, for example, working with UN agencies or NGOs like Map Action, for example, or ACAPS. Uh, these are, again, event response people. Uh, they're bringing lots of people uh, looking at the picture, so hopefully that's assisting a form of equity in both the data availability and also the way it's analysed and where that information is going. And one other thing uh, is that on the evidence-based side of things, there is um, we're often now working in collaboration, particularly with, say, World Bank and UN, with NGOs side by side on various products. They've often got much better in-country experience of social vulnerability. So how can we start to consider that? And how can they speak uh, for those concerns? And they, they clearly have to be incorporated because if we're looking at financial mechanism and, in, and instruments, you want them to be as impactful as possible with respect to aspects of uh, sustainability and social resilience. So it's very difficult but it's a, it's a many hands problem, I would say. Um, Rebecca, maybe I can, as you're in the midst of your financial reporting cycle, ask you to uh, um, respond to Beth's question around how you see those two worlds collide and can they be brought closer together? Yeah, I'm very strongly of the view they're complementary. Um, I think there's a few different ways to, to bring them aligned. Um, firstly, TCFD, I think, is a good one. Um, the International Accounting Standards Board are looking at that too. Um, and I find it quite interesting. I think we'll have a lot of colleagues who look at quarterly numbers or annual numbers. And with the question posed with TCFD, what does a two degree warming in world temperatures um, look like and do to your business? Suddenly I ask the question, what are we going to look like at 2030 or 2040 or 2050? And you see a whole bunch of people going, uh. <laughs> so I think that's an interesting one and definitely... Um, a sort of good one for accountants and finance professionals to be involved in. Um, I think the accounting qualifications themselves are another place. Um, I know there are potentially some integrations happening um, with CFA, some of the other qualifications, but also at universities. Um, and I spend a bit of time myself um, with my former university. Um, I'm currently studying now um, at Cambridge in my spare time um, when I have it. Um, and I think just making those inputs, linking in um, with the universities to bring wider definitions. So 
accounting isn't just this short-term financial input. It's all sorts of other things. And actually, it's those all sorts of other things that give you your financial outcome. But I think that's, it's a bit of a switch, and it will take a bit of time. And then you, you touched on the idea and, and some of the earlier discussions around that idea of the real time, or, or um, because, of course, in terms of the reporting cycle, it's a slow process, you know, very driven by the standards. Mm. Can you see that then being bridged? Um? Yes, I think in short, and I think technology has a really key role to play in that. I think we're at an interesting time. Um, but at that point where you can sort of push the button and see your real-time results, actually the role of an accountant changes. It's not about preparation and looking at the standards and preparing the accounts. It's about challenging the AI, the machine learning, the, the results which are coming, looking at where there could be feedback loops, dealing with the regulator on some of those items, um, and analysing and taking that into information which can inform strategy. Um, so I think that, that will change the role of an accountant over time but it'll be the coming years, I'd say. Um, Carol, maybe you could pick up on the, that, the final of the, the three questions around whether um, investors using and having information beyond that that, that companies um, give them um, will force better disclosure. Um, well, my answer is definitely yes, um, but let's, 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 let's go to the, to the EBRD as an example. Um, uh, before we finance a project, yeah, we, then we do quite a lot of due diligence work. And one of the biggest failures that we can make is not using the information available. Um, that may even in the end of also have legal implications, but at least it has a big, I would say, reputational, yeah. reputational risk. And I think that counts for everyone. Um, having, I would say, spatial detailed spatial information available and not using it, uh, I think would give, uh, I would say, uh, will we'll, we'll have legal implications and this, this will drive a companies to be more transparent, take that information into account. And on the other hand, it's also, it's also just fun. I remember that we, uh, we, had, we had been financing a solar park in Egypt and uh, just uh, looking at Google Earth, how is the solar park developing? And suddenly it was on Google Earth and that was a moment of, uh, well, Let's have a coffee because it's on Google Earth. <laughs> I mean, it's a very simplistic way of monitoring, but you can also look at it in the other way around, that if you indeed, um, and I have a background in the, in the oil and gas industry, and we basically already worked with, I would say, spatial information in the 90s. It was mm. the core business, uh, having that type of information available to, to drive the business. Um, of course, this information was not, I would say, publicly disclosed because it's in the core of, of your business, in the core of your opportunities. <coughs> and I'm... I'm I'm a, I was a bit surprised moving from, the, I would say, this, this engineering environment going to the financial environment, how little of that type of information was being used. Uh, every type of information was being, I would say, translated in, into financial numbers. Um, but, but there was not, I would say, not a st very strong drive to go back uh, what is really behind the numbers. And that's, I think, uh, uh, that, that will change very much if this... If, if, if this type of, I would say, uh, uh, spatial information become, become publicly available. Yeah. Um, ben? I have very quick answers on, on those from a very portfolio managers. We're very pragmatic in the practitioner view. On the question of tools and data, um, I think it's going to rely on great people like you. And this is to Will's point. We need uh, people who are thoughtful about how they're going to use the data and tools because like fire or the hammer, you can use it to destroy or you can use it to build. And obviously there's risk and dangers about this negative feedback loop, but if people are aware and signaling that up on top, ultimately it will be the people in charge and human who are going to have to direct those data and tools. So make that known, make that aware, and, and keep doing that. On the point of the accountants and the accountancy, uh, if you look at the last 50, 100 years of this, um, that world is always going to be behind market practice. Uh, that is the same with regulation. At any point in time, the best regulation in the world uh, captures the best thing at that point in time, and then really it ossifies because a year later, uh, market practice has already evolved. And so you can see that. In fact, I'm doing a project with IFRS now on management commentary, and there's a lot of stuff on purpose, on extra financials and things which are coming through. 
but ultimately it would be behind market practitioner, uh, things like the spatial data, and that will drive actually what is, uh, what is happening in markets. And so to your last question, yes, it really does make a difference, although here there's a lot of debate over this word materiality, which actually is different for corporates, is different from investors, and different from uh, accountants, strangely, with this just one word. But where we find that data is material, this is investors and push it forward, and it's affecting or impacting companies or the systems, then it does get disclosed and you have this uh, conversation because if other people find it material to the business and then it affects things, then it has having this big impact. And so you'll find, I think, where spatial finance data is turning material, then it will be incumbent upon all of these other people um, in the chain, companies and things, will start to use that data. And they'll use it before it gets into uh, report and accounts and things like that uh, because that will be market practice. Um, okay, I think we've got time for another round of questions. So one at the front here, one in the middle here. Hello, my name is Frank. Um, uh, Frank Wolf from, from uh, Right Based on Science, a climate rating agency based in Frankfurt. <coughs> and my question is how to make climate change risk more tangible to companies, not as a physical risk alone to their assets, but on a global scale, so how to incorporate uh, their uh, contribution as well. Uh, is it just regulations or are there certain KBIs or what, what are your gener is the general take on that? Okay. Thank you. Great. Hi, Maxine Nelson from the Global Association of Risk Professionals. There's been quite a lot of discussion, I think, in all the panels about um, use of I think, data science more broadly. And in the geospatial area, the, my, my takeaway is that the discussion has been around, it can be used in things like assessing wind farms and it can be used to assess later on is infrastructure being built. Is, has, have people seen this used more broadly than some quite narrow applications or even earlier in the decision making process in other fields as well, not just looking at things like wind farms being built but other types of assets and there's also the, the, um, the point earlier about in the asset finance um, field it could be used. So my question is has it been used more broadly have you seen it or do you think this is such a new field and developing field that people are still working out where they can use it earlier in the decision making process and where they can use it more broadly across different industry types? Okay, great. And then um, third question from the lady here in the front row. If you, um, yeah, the, the microphone's just coming over. There you go. Uh, this is Hernani Veitia from uh, Lucairos. And the question is about the um, issue of too big to fail. Uh, looks to me that the problem is too big means the possibility to, hi to hide the information. And I am referring, for example, for the green bonds market. HSBC has very active in uh, worldwide with the green bonds, but are so big the, um, the funds that even if we try to monitor the assets, doesn't matter what happened with that asset because the fund is so big that uh, it's unsubstantial the underperformance of one specific a wind farm or one hydroelectric uh, plant because they are a structure so big that uh, it's a way in which they are reducing the risk, but at the same time, is missing the transparency for the investors. Okay, great. Um, so who wants to answer the, the first one around how do we really make this? Yeah, yeah, I think I might, John, might tackle that one. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good point, and the Climate risk analytics can take place and is taking place at a variety of levels. So it might be uh, at a corporate level uh, where we analyze their specific assets at risk for a range of activities, acute, chronic, and this systemic risk as well. So that's, uh, again, that the supply chain component, the indirect risks. Uh, but often we are also, it, it came up a little earlier, looking at a, a, a city level as well. The cities potentially have revenue raising capacity through municipal bonds. To what extent uh, and how can they prioritize their investment against uh, oncoming climate risks, for example, be it sea level rise in Miami or, or wherever. So, and then up to the, up to the national level, where often uh, we're also looking at uh, national vulnerability 
to climate risk on infrastructure uh, in particular. And maybe that speaks to, to the, sec the other question about which sectors are, are taking this up faster, particularly in the work that we're involved with. Generally, the things that don't move around, particularly like real estate, for example, have made it a lot easier to apply some of these spatial analytics. It's very, it's very familiar. It's closer to a lot of our day jobs. We're extending the range of the hazard uh, to try and incorporate uh, temporal profiles of climate projections for that. Uh, but we're starting to see that proliferate much more widely. But we're going to have to also think and come up with some quite innovative and in ingenious ideas about how we apply that to other sectors. Thank you for the questions. Um, and also just to add perhaps a little bit of context. Um, so our corporate wholesale balance sheet is 600 billion US dollars. It is huge. Um, and I'll link it to the first question. If I then take HSBC's green bonds in issue, they are 4 billion US dollars. So you're absolutely right. It's a small piece if you look at the whole. That reflects the market right now. If I look at the green bonds market and compare it to the overall size of the fixed income market, it's 1%. It's tiny <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. So there is a very real issue there. Now, how I see this evolve and how I think about it from HSBC, I see that green bonds piece as almost the bottom up. So that is trying to get the impact on that 4 billion and we do present numbers, wind farms, which have been um, an infrastructure, um, the carbon emissions, which have been avoided. Um, so that's, a, if you like, the bottom-up data. Right now, we don't have that information. So we have to go to a customer in order that they can get that information. And sometimes they say, we don't know. So then we have to work with them um, to try and get it. So if you like, that's the bottom-up. At the same time, on the 600 billion in materiality and how do you make this real, there's a top-down approach, and I think the two will start to converge over time. That's my hope. Um, and on that top-down, what we do is look at the sectors where we have higher transition risks. So that could be oil, gas, buildings, autos, chemicals. Um, so those which have higher uh, materiality to climate change. We we'll look at the exposures that we have, our largest customers there, and again, it's working with those customers, asking them, what are you doing? How are you thinking about transition? Um, let's have a look at your carbon emissions, scope one, two, three. Let's look at your methane levels, air pollution, water. But the data, a lot of the data is quite challenging at the moment. It's estimates. It's not available. There are gaps. There are quite significant gaps in emerging markets, more so than in Europe and the US, I would say. Depends on the size of the customer. Um, so if I look at, for example, global banking and markets, um, where we have large multinationals, huge amount of them publish car uh, their carbon dioxide numbers already. If I then go to smaller corporates in Asia, typically um, sort of, yeah, very much smaller in nature and business banking, they wouldn't necessarily have that information to hand. So it's very much a partnership, working with them, um, and I hope that the sort of top down over time meets the bottom up. Um, but it will take a bit of time and collaboration working with our customers, but also um, with industry experts, with CDP, Carbon Disclosure Project, and others. I think that's going to be really key. Um, ben, Carol, any other? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, I, I just want to, to, uh, to respond to this question on, uh, on, on, on uh, use data science more broadly. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to answer, but um, because what I see uh, also in the, in the EBRD that um, especially the last two years, suddenly things have become much more complicated than they were before. Um, and one of the reasons is that, um, uh, and that has to do really with this transition thinking, that if you think about transition, then it's not about building another wind park or building another solar panel. It's very much about making a certain economical activity or making a certain activity, I would say more climate resilient and more resilient basically also for, I would say, carbon transition risks. And, and that basically is a, is a, is a different mindset. Um, so instead of uh, just looking at what is the, I would say, the CO2 reduction of a project or how much resilient is, such, is, a, is a project, it's far more going to a higher level, uh, to the level of the corporate or to the level of the client, and how basically are we making a transition at the client, and how are we basically also achieving capabilities of the client. So it's not so much about uh, having data 
available for our organization, but as a development bank, it's far more about how do we enable our clients to have access to data and bring in, um, I would say, environmental data, but it could also be other social data, into their, I would say, corporate strategy. And what are the KPIs and the, um, uh, the information that the, these clients are, are being using? And instead of um, well, assessing a project on the basis of, I would say, very simple uh, KPIs like megawatts installed uh, of renewable energy, we get far more difficult types of information like uh, what is the behavior change of the client, is the client changing its strategy, are they looking for other business opportunities, are they changing their business model, are they um, um, even, even, yeah, it, it, are, uh, is their governance structure changing? And, and it would be very interesting because that type of data is, is very difficult to assess. So it would be interesting how, how we can use data science also to, to measure these, I would say, less direct, uh, less direct impacts. Um, great, Ben. I have maybe a quick comment on uh, making it sort of more real. So obviously we have the policy front, the investor front, regulators and things like that. But I think you might be surprised in terms of the companies I'm speaking to and that um, a lot of it is actually coming from the employees. And as those employees become more senior and as it's more important to them and the voice is, and the voice is heard, we've talked a lot about millennials, intergeneration Z and things, and as that transitions up, well, who runs these companies? They are still run by people, not AI yet. So um, it, it is actually convincing those people. And at the organizations which are more forward looking, it's because the senior managers there who have, who have come through have nudged that agenda away. Yes, they're nudged by uh, investors, um, politicians, and actually suppliers and customers. If your end consumer you know, is the millennial, you hear it very uh, acutely. Uh, but if you are in those positions, or you're going to be in the positions, or you're talking to those senior managers, and you convince them, then those companies change. And I actually, this is one part of being hopeful, because a lot of it is a cultural behavioral change empowered by technology, those kind of changes can actually happen relatively swiftly. You might be surprised you know, if you look at the generations, how we do things differently. And so it only takes a change at those layers of those uh, managements and companies uh, to make that change. So I think how we make it real is we convince the people in those organizations uh, about that. And I, maybe the pace of it isn't quick enough as yet, but it is happening. And you might find that it's not linear, that actually it's one of these step changes. Suddenly, all of the C-suite are on board with that. Next year, it's all a completely different story. So keep at it, and I think that is how we are making it real. Um, John, can I maybe ask you just to say a little bit more, picking up on that third question? Because I think um, you know, you, you'd alluded to one of the, the examples of how data science is being used more broadly um, in, in your reply. But maybe you could rattle off a few others of just how you see it already and, and some of the areas you might see in the next year or two. Well, um, there's, it's fascinating how the, the techniques that we've developed, suddenly people are coming to us saying from the most unlikely places, for example, natural capital, ecosystem services, we saw a tremendous image of coral reef, for example. To what extent can risk management processes and possibly the risk transfer associated with insurance start to deal with some of those aspects? So marine protection areas, uh, there's sort of the more familiar things like coral reef and their ability to reduce energy from storm surge, for example. And so there's a value for that. How can we maintain that embedded value in the biodiversity? Um, so it's playing a role in in much, in much more complicated uh, worlds than we perhaps never expected to be involved with. I mean, other aspects, again, extending across perils. I mentioned some of the drought work uh, in Africa. And also, again, about those correlations of risk. So we're looking at water stress, for example, with an NGO and the correlation of that with geopolitical aspects, migration, civil unrest, for example. And even to what extent can uh, data mining, uh, AI approaches be applied to data sets. Um, so there's a plethora of new players. A key element is lots of people speaking to, uh, well, often non-technical audiences. So the ability to communicate often what are quite uh, uh, complex technical aspects to broader 
to uh, non-technical audiences. Also, the other way around. It's like understanding what the needs are. And again, back to these metrics. Uh, how to, how, what language do we need to be able to speak in, in financial terms, for example, on the balance sheet or whatever, to be able to incorporate prioritization of climate resilience, for example? What's the quickest way? What are the most amenable ways? And there will be a range, a spectrum of requirements at different levels, both spatial and temporal, to be able to communicate that work. Great. Um, so I think that to summarize the discussion, if I, if I can, it's clear that across all of your different um, areas of expertise, geospatial information is already starting to have an impact. Um, but the potential really exists to go much further. I think there's some really interesting examples, particularly in that predictive space, of whether it is you know, identifying new opportunities for, for lending around solar or um, other areas that can help to really accelerate the pace of change on, um, around climate or um, predictive around drought or around the, the, the need to build resilient infrastructure. Um, but also then join the dots across whether it's some of the social dimensions, the environmental um, and the financial. So I think there's, there's definitely a watch this space, um, think about the ethics of it, and I think that that question is, I suspect, one that we're going to be coming back to a lot more. So um, I'd like to thank the panel um, and then hand back over to Ben.